This is Mark Zadie. He is very active on the MHSC forum, so if you've spent any time there, he has probably answered your questions. He is very knowledgeable and well, knowledgeable enough to find a USB. Oh, for. yeah, I know it's hidden. <laughs> and is simultaneously a grad student at the University of Toronto and running a pathology company. Okay, ladies, gentlemen, everything in between and none of the above, welcome to my presentation. Uh, today, I'll be discussing some practical applications of multiplex analysis of workflows in QPath with a primary focus on recent publication in which we used it to quantify immune cell phenotypes associated with kidney injury caused by immune checkpoint inhibitors. So just some uh, quick things to disclose. I'm currently a PhD student in the Department of Medical Biophysics at the University of Toronto. I'm also Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder of Pathomics.io, a contract research organization that offers image analysis services to academics and pharma alike. So if you're interested in, you know, learning more about our services or even how you guys can be a part of the team, feel free to reach out to me at mark at pathomics.io. So in this presentation, I'll discuss some of the methods developed for analyzing multiplex IFC data sets in QPath, and finally showcase some examples of how this was applied to characterize the immune cell phenotype in uh, patients with acute kidney injury caused by immune checkpoint inhibitors. So most of what I'll be presenting uh, will use elements of the workshop cover today and tomorrow, but I'll be showing applications of Stardust for cell segmentation, multiplex classifiers to identify immune cell phenotypes, and pixel classifiers to segment renal structures. So in collaboration with a few nephrologists over at the Mayo Clinic, our aim was to use IMC to characterize the heterogeneity and identify biomarkers of kidney injury caused by immune checkpoint inhibitors. So immune checkpoint inhibitors are used in a wide variety of uh, cancer therapies, but one major side effect is acute kidney injury hypothesized to be caused by the elevated systemic circulation of you know, all of your immune cells. Now, prior studies have actually identified a panel of biomarkers indicative of acute kidney injury, termed AKI, caused by uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, ICI, as well as other causes. And having the ability to characterize the immune landscape using these markers can identify biomarkers relevant to discriminating AKI caused by ICI, as well as other types and otherwise healthy tissue. So in the study, we used imaging mass cytometry, a multiplex imaging modality with a terrible resolution of one micron per pixel, but the capacity to up, uh, image upwards of 40 immunohistochemical markers in tandem. So tissue sections are stained with heavy metal conjugated antibodies, which are then ablated and imaged with a cytop mass cytometer. This allows for highly multiplex imaging without the limitations conferred by spectral overlap. Fun fact, there is no light being used in these images. Now, prior to identification of cell types, we must first identify our cells. Uh, we perform cell segmentation using the iridium-193 intercalating agent, which is functionally similar to DAPI used in immunofluorescence microscopy, or Hirsch used in some of these presentations or interactive demos. Stardust is a machine learning algorithm used extensively in segmenting DAPI stained nuclei. And one attribution for its widespread implementation in numerous digital pathology workflows, let alone QPath, is the large training data set used in the publicly available models. However, none such models exist, or at least in the size that they do for IMC data. So I've been able to essentially transform our, DAPI, uh, our iridium channel into a pseudo DAPI image enough to enable robust segmentation of our kidney samples. And further developing this as an extension for QPath, I've been able to segment HME, IF, HDAP, Hubble Space Telescope images, and for those who are active on the forum, holes and cheese. Yes, uh, just thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> that was like one of the most absurd image analysis requests, but I'm happy that Stardust made its way into it. So many puns. I know. I, I, I was going to go on and on about puns, but we're a little bit short on time, so probably not. Um, <laughs> I remember my answer was like, I believe, or believe, I have a solution. Anyways, uh, so once cells have been segmented using our adaptive starter segmentation algorithm, we then set thresholds in conjunction with a pathologist, verifying that our classifications are consistent with what they would manually annotate themselves. This, in turn, creates our composite classifier, effectively assigning every cell in our data set to one or more classes of positivity. 
We then have pathologists annotate uh, their images for different microenvironmental structures relevant for immune cell localization, such as glomeruli in blue, tubules in green, interstitium in magenta, and arteries in red. A pixel classifier is then trained and applied to segment all images across our data set. We then combine our cell classifications with green localization such that we now have hundreds of features relating to marker intensities, uh, cellular subcompartment localizations, and renal localizations. Now, combining cell classification with renal localization actually allows us to generate some spatial features, which is very much a hot topic nowadays. These spatial features can include annotation distances, so the distance of each cell to the nearest renal structure, cell distances, the distance of each cell to the nearest positive cell type, and Duane triangulation, identifying spatially grouped clusters of cells sharing markers in common. And if you guys are around for the Multiplex Image Analysis Conference, I'll be giving a talk on Friday at 4.45, detailing some practical applications of spatial features in terms of identifying spatial biomarkers not for immune checkpoint inhibitor related damage, but actually as a means of identifying causal factors of kidney transplant rejection. Anyways, independent of cell classifications, we can visualize marker intensity distributions grouped by the cause of um, immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, damage termed code. Shown here is the mean CD3 intensity of all cells grouped by API code. And visually it might not appear as there is much of a discernible difference, but the reason being is that the true, the intensities of the true negative cells typically outweigh that of true positive cells. Unless you have tissue sections where over half of your cells are immune cells, which is probably going to be very bad for the patient, um, you have to isolate your individual immune cells that you want to study and visualize them accordingly. And that is exactly what was done here. So by applying our pathology supervised thresholds, we can identify uh, the positive population of cells then find the percentage of cells positive for individual markers, as shown here for CD3. That being said, many immune cell types are typically uh, defined as being positive by more than one marker. Now, as each cell in our data set contains a list of markers that it's positive for from our, uh, from our multiplex panel, um, we can actually query cell types in an a priori manner. Here we measure the percentage of CD4 memory T cells as defined as those that are triple positive for CD3, CD4, and CD45RO. As we have 27 markers present in our uh, data set, we can perform a sort of high throughput analysis measuring the correlation of marker intensities to one another. Those in the heat map essentially indicate the experiment's correlation coefficient. Um, and one application of this heat map can be used to actually identify redundant and autocorrelated markers. So for those of you who are in the process of developing a multiplex panel, you want to make sure that with a limited panel size, you capture the greatest range of intra and intra-sample heterogeneity. There's no point in including a marker in a panel if it's going to be correlated with another marker 99% of the time. Um, so this can be one basically method of refining an IMC panel to uh, capture a greater range of heterogeneity. As a means of visualizing such heterogeneity, we can employ dimensionality reduction techniques such as UMAP uh, to, to project all cells in our data set in a reduced dimensionality space. Uh, not only can cells be colored by categorical supplementary patient information, such as the cause of AKI shown up top, but we can also color them by um, marker intensity values as shown below. So tying this back to the original study, uh, we scored our samples for a variety of immune cell subtypes, identifying those that exhibit differential scoring for one API classification relative to others. And while many subtypes exhibit variation, CD4 memory T cells, T helper cells, and dendritic cells were among some of them that were observed to be statistically significant. But as old saying goes, seeing is believing. So it's important to validate that what our results show is consistent with what's in the images themselves. Now using additive color theory, we can actually visualize um, the triple positive populations of interest. Here we highlight the relative immune cell subtypes in each row and the different disease categories in columns. In the top row, CD4 memory T cells uh, were defined as those that are CD45RO, CD4, and CD3 triple positive. Given that each single positive population's class was assigned a primary color, the triple positive population would be in white. Um, 
Similarly, T helper cells shown in the middle row were CD4 and CD3 double positive, and a mix of green and blue will yield cyan. And consequently, dendritic cells, uh, as defined as being HLA-DR and CD11C double positive, were shown in yellow. So in short, we've um, developed a pathologist uh, supervised workflow for assessing immune heterogeneity within clinical kidney IMC images. We have a pipeline that supports multiplex immune histochemistry data sets of most modalities. And we've essentially developed this highly robust, reproducible, and thanks to QPath, interpretable uh, means of directly supplementing pathologist-driven classifications with artificial intelligence models for end-to-end -end multiplex IC quantification. Now, there's many people I'd like to thank, uh, bioinformaticians, uh, supervisors, clinicians, but the true unsung heroes is the wonderful QPath community. Much like everyone in this room, I started with next to no uh, knowledge about QPath whatsoever. In fact, my bachelor's was just in biology, and through a complete mishap, I ended in a computational core with no programming knowledge whatsoever. Um, but in a sort of sink or swim situation, I had to essentially learn. And I thought I was making some pretty good progress until COVID hit. And I was stuck trying to figure out how to use image analysis software all by myself. I didn't have anyone in the lab able to you know, spend time to teach me how to use this, but what I did have was forum members. Forum members like Dr. McArdle, uh, Mike Nelson, Damon Lim, um, the anonymous and elusive research associates, and so many others have helped me tremendously in answering the hundreds of questions I have in terms of resolving object hierarchies or how to train large pixel classifiers or how to uh, implement GPU accelerated Stardust back when things weren't as you know straightforward. Um, so on that note, uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, and concerns. And um, I believe all of the, well, the publication is like free to download. Um, and Stardust, uh, all these other things I'm sure will be talked about in, if not later on today, but potentially tomorrow's session. Um, yeah. I have to take any questions, comments, and hopefully not concerns. <laughs> you had mentioned that you had to use a public data set. Let's say we're, let's say in my case, I'm looking for something more novel, and these data sets aren't publicly available. How would you recommend I go about creating this, this bigger data set so I could train you know, models on and stuff like that? Summer students are amongst one of the very inexpensive <laughs> resources. Um, but if you have a very unique cell type, that say Stardust or watershed segmentation would fail on. So a good example of this are astrocytes. Yeah. If you rely on their nuclei alone, you're not going to capture the whole cell body because they can span multiple microns. You have to go in, annotate them over and over, maybe not you, but a grad student or a summer student or anyone who has the capability of identifying an astrocyte. And then you can train a model such as cell pose, which I believe will be discussed more in tomorrow's session. And then congratulations, you have your own data set. Uh, you, you have your own model. And if you're feeling generous enough, you might want to share it on the forums. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the segment editing model, it's on my YouTube channel. I, I'm not the one who made it. It was Ko Sugawara in connection with Pete Bankhead. Show of hands, have any of you guys heard of Meta's segment anything model? I've got a few people. So the segment anything model was basically a challenge posed by Meta to develop a model that just segments anything. It identifies presumably any kind of object of interest in relation to background objects. In Pete's demonstration, he segmented his lovely guinea pigs, but you can also use it to segment cells or real structures or a wide variety of different things. Now, if you just Google search my name on YouTube, you'll find a video of me actually reviewing the segment anything model and some practical applications in terms of digital pathology, not only to segment nuclei, but to segment some of the harder things to segment like back build adipocytes, which will not stain for anything. <laughs> so add on to the, the Sam thing, if you are wanting to make like a new model that you need a bunch of ground truth for, for like running Stardust or something, SAM would be a really great way to like get you ground truth very quickly. Like the downside to using SAM and QPath is that you do have to be very interactive. It'll only segment like one item kind of at a time, but it's a much, much faster than hand annotating. Of you can even stuff. use uh, SAM's auto mask feature if you want to segment multiple yeah. items in your field of view. Oh, what makes results? 
Yeah. yeah, I had trouble setting it up as well. There was a reason that they pushed to allow for uh, GPU support for some of the larger models. One cautionary tale I'd want to make note of using SAM is it doesn't operate on original image pixel values. It operates with whatever is shown in your current field of view, your screen. So if you zoom out a lot to the point where you see your whole tissue section and you run SAM, it'll identify your whole tissue section. But if you zoom into an individual cell, and you uh, run SAM, it'll identify an individual cell. It's great in terms of, of doing the challenge that you had, which was trying to segment astrocytes, trying to use SAM as a means of you know, segmenting astrocytes to an extent that might be better than using the brush tool or the wand tool in QPath. If it's the super wand tool. Uh, yeah, super wand tool. That's actually a great analogy. Yeah, super wand tool. A little bit more computationally intensive, yeah. but you've got a GPU, anything's possible. NVIDIA GPU, that is. <laughs> if you have um, if you have some duplicate cells, cell phones might also be a really good um, option to use. They have a lot of really great pre-trained algorithms that can also run in GPU path and, and interactively and interact. Yeah, they're they're great. Okay, so there's a lot of awesome options out there. Imaging mass cytometry. Oh, imaging mass. So the uh, resolution might terrible. One micron per pixel. This was actually a technology developed in Ontario, uh, the province from which I'm from, uh, by a company called Fluidine, but now we ran it as standard biotools. And for the past six years, they've been fixed at a resolution of approximately one micron per pixel. I believe my understanding is that it's a technical limitation of how the system works, but you basically have a laser vaporizing your uh, tissue sections instead of staying with a cocktail of heavy metal conjugated antibodies. And this laser can only ablate sections at one micron per pixel. When it gets ablated, you basically have this plume of ionized plasma that gets sucked up into a mass spectrometer. Now, the melts that they use are typically the ones in you know, the lanthanide series of the periodic table, things that have a really high mass and have an oxidation state of about plus one or plus two that yields a fairly high mass to charge ratio. So in fact, you can actually image up to, I believe nowadays, it's close to 50 different immunohistochemical markers in tandem. But again, the caveat, like you mentioned, is the poor resolution of one micron per pixel. Phenocycler fusion, comets, um, and more modern uh, multiplex imaging modalities have resolutions that are about 500% higher at 0.22 microns per pixel. That being said, they're also more expensive because IMC only ablates individual regions of interest. So in your experiment, if, when you're planning out your experiment, of course you have a budget to work with. Would you rather have full slide images from a few slides, uh, from a few samples, or would you have multiple individual regions of interest from many more samples? That's a, I guess you could say design consideration whether or not you want to capture more intertumor heterogeneity or intratumoral heterogeneity or intersample, not tumor.